case on this morning's docket. Case number 116937, State of Kansas v. Kent D. Lindemuth. May it please the court, Chris Elslager appearing on behalf of the state. And Mr. Chief Justice, I would like to request three minutes rebuttal time. Three minutes is granted. Now I have the unenviable task of coming into this case very, very late because Rachel Pickering was recently appointed to the district court bench. So I've taken the case over for her. And in reviewing the Court of Appeals opinion and reviewing the record, it seemed to me that the Court of Appeals here got lost in the abstract and lost sight of the concrete reality of the case. And it just occurred to me that I'm also supposed to recite some of the facts of the case. Let me get to that first. This case started with a truck driver who worked for a company called Welco that was hauling parts for BNSF. And he parked his truck, a tractor trailer, in a shopping center parking lot here in Topeka and then detached the trailer so he could go get, I believe, something to eat. While he was gone, Mr. Linden, the defendant in this case, saw the truck in the parking lot that was property that he owned. And he decided that he was going to have it towed away. So he called one of his own employees and towed the trailer away and told the truck driver there was also, I think, a BNSF employee that came to the scene and basically gave them his name and number and said, you have your boss call me or something along those lines. So the truck driver got in touch with the company. Mr. Matthews, the owner of the trucking company, called Mr. Linden from the number that he was provided, trying to find out, well, why did you take my trailer? What's going on? And Mr. Linden basically told him he wouldn't get his trailer back unless he paid him like $20,000, $25,000. And this was a cargo that needed to be hauled rather quickly. And the discussions apparently got pretty heated. And in the discussions, Mr. Linden was told Mr. Matthews that he would shoot him, he would fill him full of holes, he'd kill him, basically made criminal threats. Mr. Matthews had a private plane. He flew to Topeka that evening. Police got involved. Eventually, the trailer was returned and went on its way. And the police eventually charged Mr. Linden with making criminal threats. And then he was convicted. He appealed to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals reversed the conviction, and here we are. What are we going to do with the fact that the statute he was convicted under is unconstitutional? Well, that's a recent development that I can say. I think that in this case, I would argue that, well, two things. One, that that particular issue was never raised below. I mean, that's the first thing. So it hasn't been briefed. It hasn't been, I mean, the decision only came out, I think, last week. But Linden certainly could have raised the same overbreath challenge that those, I think Johnson and Betker was the other case, that those defendants could have raised. He didn't raise that, so I would argue that he waived that argument. So he doesn't get the benefit of that court decision, even though his case is on direct appeal? Well, again, I would say he waived the argument. He could have raised it, and he didn't. It's kind of like the position the state found itself in, in the state de nice, when at the oral argument, the idea of good faith was brought up, but the court refused to address it because the state didn't argue. The state waived it, and then it came up in a later case. It's a little different when the statute's unconstitutional. You're trying to send somebody to prison on an unconstitutional statute while their appeal's still pending. Is that really the state's position here? Well, again, I mean, my first position is that, well, it wasn't raised as waived. The second position, too, is that that decision just came out, and quite honestly, I mean, it will, assuming it stands, it will take presidential value, but right now it hasn't, and I know that it's a point of discussion within our office of whether to seek cert with the U.S. Supreme Court or not. It is apparently an issue where there's a split of opinion among the states, and so it might be, and even within the Supreme Court, there's a U.S. Supreme Court, there was a decision on a similar issue. So it may be something we take up. Right now, I'm not really sure where that stands. I guess ultimately, if the court, you know, if that decision stands, then this court, I guess, could 
could find that would be a, a you know, I guess the defendant could win on that. Um, but then I think also you need to consider the uh, whether or not the the error was harmless because the part are you of the statute that was count are, maybe I cut you off too early because you're about to move to harmlessness. But it sounded like you were conceding that if Johnson applies, you lose. Well, I mean, potentially, I, I think, and again, that, that case came out I think last Friday, so I haven't. Honestly, I haven't fully digested it or how it would apply to this case, and, and I came into this case rather late, so I'm, I am a, shooting from the hip a little bit here at the podium, uh, and I don't, so I want to be careful and not concede uh, anything at this point. Uh, but I do recognize that if the statute is unconstitutional. Well, only that, part of the statute. Right, that's what I was getting to. The, the reckless part was, was declared unconstitutional. I think we could argue that in this case that is uh, harmless because. Uh, I don't believe the state ever argued that this was reckless conduct. When I looked at the, the closing argument from the state, uh, the, the prosecutor said, what do you think a person's intent is when they say, I'm going to kill you? It's not wishing you a happy day. It's, it's not wanting you to have a pleasant weekend. The intent behind the statement, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to really your body with holes is clear. So the state always argued that this was intentional conduct, not, not reckless conduct. And I think the facts bear that out too, because this was, this was a one-on-one -on -one conversation, a one-on-one -on -one phone call between these two individuals. This wasn't uh, Mr. Lindemuth, um, you know, losing his composure in a group setting and shouting out uh, threats and so on. This was, this was a one-on-one -on -one conversation where it was, I mean, it, it was clear what the intent was back and forth with two individuals. There's no, I don't think that you could argue there's any reckless conduct here. So I would argue then that, uh, that under a harmless error analysis, the, the overbreadth or potential overbreadth of the statute uh, with regard to recklessness is, is harmless. Counsel, I, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm being respectful of the notion that you're thrown into this case um, at the last minute, uh, but we did issue an order on Monday that said come prepared to talk about this. I think you're going to find when you look at the prosecutor's comments to the jury that the, the prosecutor did talk about reckless disregard both in Vordire and in closing argument. So uh, I don't want you to get too far out on the limb, not knowing everything i think i think we can agree can't we that the johnson case which simply took the, the bodiger decision which was the main decision but the johnson case perfectly aligns with your facts with the, the procedural posture of glindemouth not I'm, I'm not getting into the evidence okay. yet i realize that and and i'm not trying to hold you on the harmless error thing i'm just but procedurally we know that the defendant in Johnson and your and, and Mr. Lindemuth were both charged in the in the alternative with the or, so it was both intentional or disregard. The jury was instructed that way. The uh, court did not ask for any kind of unanimity, nor did the the uh, verdict forms request that the jury pick and choose between intentional or disregard. So as we're as we're sitting here with just the procedural posture, we can't really tell whether the defendant was convicted on intentional or on reckless disregard. You, you would agree with that, wouldn't you? Well, I just think the facts, I would argue that the facts point only to intentional conduct. That's your harmlessness argument, but as far as getting it teed up to harmlessness, we don't have any distinction between Johnson. I, I would agree with that. Okay. Yes. okay. Okay, um, I have just a short amount of time left. I will get to the what was. Let me ask you one before. other question. You haven't, okay, you haven't asked for, you haven't responded to the defendant's 609 letter that was filed last Friday. Right. Do you want to file a response? Is this something that we need, or do you think we've got all we need to know? Well, at this point, my, my, my reading of the case, I, I think you have everything you need to know. I think really I have to just make the harmless error. Uh, argument and that's I think that's all I can make I mean do you want to make it I, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm down to if you're giving I, me I, if you're giving me an case, opportunity yes this case was not all the facts and the briefs and everything has all been geared toward uh, you know the issue that we started with right on this thing but we haven't looked at the facts in relationship to whether 
uh, it's, it was possible for the jury to have, con you know, under the facts, to have only convicted under intentional. And there may be some some members of this court that don't even think that's a fair play, but uh, to talk about. But let's set that aside. I'm just saying no one has has digested this case from a harmless error based on the constitutional standard that arises once he was, like we did in Johnson or right. Boddicker. Well, and yes, I think that if if the court would allow it, I, I would, of course, uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to actually brief the matter, and I think the opposing side would, would should also have the opportunity then to brief the matter, file supplemental briefs on that particular issue. I would just ask the court, if, if that's where the court wants to go, then uh, you know, please either direct me to do so now or, or, or issue an order so that we know that we're in that procedural context. Um, in the, the last three minutes that I have, I just want to briefly touch on the argument that, that brought this uh, case here. Um, basically, uh, the, the concrete reality of this is that the, the, uh, the evidence in the record just does not support the giving of a defense of property or self-defense type of instruction. Uh, there's two prongs, the court knows, there's a, a subjective belief uh, that self-defense is necessary and an objective belief uh, that a reasonable person would think uh, a threat of force or force was necessary. Here, um, uh, Linda's defense was not, he never, he never asserted an affirmative defense of defensive workplace or self-defense. His defense was a complete denial. I didn't make the threats. Um, there's no evidence in the record at all that he felt a need, he had a subjective belief that he needed to defend himself or his workplace. He never testified that he felt threatened by Matthews. He never said that he was afraid of him. There, he never uh, testified that he was afraid that Matthews was going to make an, uh, an attempt at an unlawful entry into his place of business. That's a requirement for the defense of property. Uh, and in fact, um, he, you know, he completely denied making any threats. It wasn't just that he had an inconsistent defense. His defense would be mutually exclusive from the, the uh, affirmative defense of self-defense. Um, with respect to the objective, uh, the reasonable person requirement, um, I think you can factor all that in, but also, you know, Matthews, his testimony was that Linda was test, uh, threatened him first, uh, and I think what is also particularly important is Matthews was in another state, and they were talking over the phone, so it's hard to believe that any person, a reasonable person, would feel the need to defend himself from somebody that is uh, hours away in another state talking over the phone. I mean, they could just hang up the phone if they got sick of the person, but uh, the person was being intimidating, but there's no no real possibility of any actual physical uh, physical injury to the person on the phone to Mr. Lindemuth. There's no actual possibility of, of Mr. Matthews making an unlawful entry into his place of business because he's a state away. And furthermore, Matthews didn't even know where Lindemuth's place of business was. When he called him, it was a cell phone. Lindemuth could have been anywhere. He could have been in, a, you know, in his car, a restaurant, whatever. The fact that he happened to be at his place of business and suddenly transform this into a, into a defense of a workplace uh, situation because uh, Matthews couldn't have made the uh, an unlawful entry into <coughs> Lindemuth's place of business and couldn't have uh, threatened Lindemuth uh, with physical harm because he didn't know where Lindemuth was. And Lindemuth knew that. He knew that he didn't know where he was because when again when, when Matthews got to Topeka he had to call Lindemuth again to try to set up a meeting because he didn't know where he was. Uh, so I think a reasonable person in that situation would not feel that there was any need to to use the force use force or threat of force uh, to defend themselves. Um, <clears throat> And I, I think at this point, beyond that, I guess I will, I will submit the remaining arguments on the briefs. I see my time is, is running out. I'll reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal, unless there are any other questions. We did use a lot of your time for our questions. Do you want to take another minute to continue or wait until rebuttal? Um, well, I, th I think unless there are any questions from the court, I'll just wait for rebuttal. During your time, you'll be working on your supplemental brief. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, counsel. <clears throat> May it please the court, Chris Joseph on behalf of Kent Lindemuth. Um, I want to start with Johnson. I agree that the case that came out on Friday tracks this one almost identically. The same instruction, the same verdict form. And I do agree that the only question really is harmless error under the constitutional harmless error analysis. I think that is controlling. Um, I also think there's incredible guidance both from Johnson and Bodiger in terms of the facts. Um, if Johnson wasn't constitutional harmless error where he's ripped a phone out of the wall and threatened, I will kill you, mom, uh, and that incorporated possible recklessness, this case 
uh, is even further, closer on the pendulum, I'd say, to Bodiger in terms of facts that would support the possibility of recklessness. Uh, I would suggest that there is evidence for which recklessness uh, could be determined, and frankly, that disposes of this case because uh, he could have been convicted uh, on recklessness, and no, uh, there is uh, a possibility, uh, and frankly, that means the state has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt it was not a possibility. Uh, why is there uh, possible for possibility for recklessness? Um, the state, frankly, just kind of pointed that out. Uh, the distance, all of their arguments in the brief for why the instruction shouldn't have been given. Um, this was a, a statement, I believe, uh, Mr. Matthew says, I'm coming to you, I'm coming to get you, and we're going to get into it. In response, a statement was made, well, then I'll shoot you. But they were, in fact, far apart, and it was, in fact, contingent on him coming. Uh, could that be a reckless threat because there was no evidence? Uh, were these gentlemen just hotheads that were yelling at each other? The prosecutor described them as a live wire, uh, that Mr. Matthews is a live wire? Well, of course. Maybe he didn't intend to put the man in fear. In fact, uh, having read the transcript, you might get the sense that he wasn't in fear. He said he wanted to fight the guy at the trial. Uh, this guy probably is not somebody that Mr. Lindenmuth was trying to put in fear. Uh, if anything, if he was convicted, it more likely could be recklessness that the jury was thinking of because he was at a great distance. He was not somebody uh, that is receptive to being put in fear. Um, so when looking at Johnson, and, and frankly, I mean, the state argued recklessness, you know, with all of those factors, and if Johnson, uh, the facts of Johnson's of pulling out the phone out of the wall and saying, I'm gonna kill you, uh, if that is possible for recklessness, this is certainly um, possible that a juror convicted based on recklessness as well. So I think the whole game in this case changed with the opinions that came out on Friday, thus the Rule 609 letter. Um, applying that precedent uh, results in a reversal. In my what opinion. about the notion that you guys didn't raise this issue? Uh, that's true. Um, I think everybody agrees that you cannot convict somebody uh, under a constitutionally invalid statute. That's the fundamental premise. Um, there have been a number of cases where uh, not only, well, first of all, all new opinions of the Supreme Court apply to pending cases. And fundamentally, you can't convict somebody of a constitutionally invalid statute. Combine those two, and I think you're there. Now, there's also, uh, interestingly, as I was preparing for this, um, there's precedent where this court has done sua sponte, said a case is, a statute's just been declared unconstitutional, we're going to apply it, despite the fact it being outside of the brief uh, and not being raised. What I'm thinking of is um, State v. Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, it's a 1996 case, citation is 259, can 117 at 123, Apparently, this case came down at the same time that the another case came down, State v. Bryan, where the statute was deemed unconstitutional. It's a stalking case. Um, the court says, this court says, uh, Wright's contention is a problem beyond what was argued in the briefs. Nonetheless, they apply it and say, you know, it's unconstitutional now. Here we are. Here you go. Um, sure, it would have been nice to have recognized the issue or thought of the issue and raised it, but I don't think it's beyond the scope of what this court can consider. Does that conclude your presentation? I think it does, unless the court really wants me to get into the, the rest. I don't think we need to get there. I think the Johnson uh, addresses everything. Do we have any more questions? All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I just have a couple of quick uh, comments in, in rebuttal. I, I think first it, it is important to recognize that the, the statute that was declared unconstitutional was only declared partially unconstitutional. So there is part of it that is still constitutional. So we're not in a situation where uh, Mr. Lindemuth has been convicted of a clearly unconstitutional statute where there's no constitutional application. It, it can be clearly uh, uh, constitutionally applied for intentional conduct. So I think that the court has to look, uh, you know, the court is, is Obligated to uh, by statute to not to reverse uh, uh, if the if the error is determined to be harmless. So I think the court does have to look to see if if the intentional you know in, in this case if under the facts that clearly Mr. Lindemuth was was convicted of intentional conduct 
then it would still be constitutional, and, and he could his uh, conviction could be affirmed. And then, of course, the court would have to consider the original um, issues that were that were raised and brought this here. And I also want to briefly mention on Johnson. I think I think there are distinguishing facts there. Um, again, Johnson just came out on Friday, and, and I'm. I have not completely, admittedly, I've not completely reviewed the record in this case. I've reviewed what I thought were the relevant portions of it uh, based on the arguments that were uh, that were raised in, in the briefs in, in preparing for this. But I know that uh, I remember reading in Johnson that there was some testimony among this family that they would routinely say things to each other like, I'm going to kill you and so on when they would get angry or whatever without actually meaning it. So that there was, I think, more evidence of what you could consider reckless conduct, whereas here we have one-on-one -on -one conversation between two individuals uh, where I think you could uh, reasonably conclude that it was plainly intentional conduct. Um, as far as the state's arguments and so on, I know Justice Biles wanted to point out to me that there may have been some discussion from the state that this was, was reckless. Uh, I didn't read all the state's arguments in, in, in preparation. I read the closing argument, and I, I recall that the portion I read to you where she spoke about intent. And I obviously, though, that the, the instruction did include the, the, the overall both prongs of the of the criminal threat statute, but having said all that, I think it is uh, it, it is worthwhile to consider whether or not the error was was harmless. And I think uh, to Justice Biles' uh, suggestion, after having a little bit of time to think it over, that it probably would be uh, uh, would be good for both sides to brief that particular issue, since it wasn't raised below. Neither side has briefed it, uh, and so we're kind of speaking extemporaneously up here at the podium. So I would ask the court if you if the court was going to rule in that. Uh, go down that path that I would ask the court to give both sides the opportunity to brief the harmlessness. Do we have any further questions? And that concludes your presentation? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.